we're going to start with the debate of this second panel. Um, the panelists have been presented before, so I'm just going to, to start. But first of all, let me, um, yeah, if Professor Waters and Quartrup and also Professor Levra, if you can, if you can switch on the camera, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Camera, it's the organizer of what to do. Uh, I think you can switch on, Nicola. I think that uh, at the moment you have the. Okay. So you will know that you have the possibility. I mean, there is the bottom for in the interpretation. The bottom in, at the at the bottom of the of the screen, you will see a, a glow with the uh, interpretation with two possibilities. Please uh, use it because I'm going to speak in Spanish uh, for the questions. And I also for the public, I mean, if anybody wants to me to ask any question, you can do it both in English or in Spanish. If it's in English, I would just read it. Uh, and if it's in Spanish, the same, because there will be the, the interpretation, the translation, the direct translation. So it's not going to be any problem at all. So please let me know, at least if there is any problem in the, in the translation, please let me know. And I will go on speaking in English. But if it's not, please... Uh, switch on the interpretation in the bottom at the bottom uh, part of the of the screen, okay. Bueno, pues vamos a a, a, a empezar eh, con cuestiones que sin duda se van a, a vincular con uh, con la pro, con la anterior uh, mesa y lo quizás lo lo, lo, lo primero que, que me gustaría plantearles a los panelistas a, a, a los uh, participantes en esta mesa es si tienen ya de entrada algún comentario que les haya sugerido eh, alguna intervención de alguno de ellos es decir si eh, hay una, una primera reacción a los vídeos que hemos ido viendo en esta última hora eh, no sé si profesora McEwen Professor Waters, Professor Quartrup, Professor Lebra, Lebra tiene un comentario. Please go on. Yeah, please. When you want. Shall I start? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the colleagues, for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and actually, I find it very interesting because somehow through different paths, I think uh, the proposal of Timothy and mine are quite close. This idea that actually, yes, there should be commitment also on the side of uh, the claimants. One point uh, important in what Timothy said was about this idea that we need to change the interpretation, the understanding of what is written in the treaties. And on that point, uh, Nicola McEwan, uh, express this idea that is common sense in the EU that somehow um, taking into account these claims for recognition of stateless nation is kind of opposite to integration, is perceived as dis disintegration. And I think this is a wrong perception. Again, if you look at Article 1 of the Treaty on the European Union, not only does it say that it is an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, but very clearly, uh, this Article 1, the first paragraph, deals about member states. And it clearly says the member states, they confer competences to the EU to attain the objective. And the objective is in the second paragraph, which is an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. So basically, the fact that peoples of Europe, even if they're not people as the people of a member state are claiming their wish to participate to the project is definitely part of the project. So like Timothy proposed to change the interpretation of Article 50, we also need to change the interpretation of the understanding of Article 1. And then uh, back to um, what Timothy said, uh, it made me think this idea that actually the claimants for example, the Catalans or whichever uh, people of Europe without a state claims full participation to the EU should meet some constraints, some requirement. It made me think of this idea that was developed by Paul Williams about earned sovereignty. This idea that even if you have a referendum or a legitimate cause to 
claim your sovereignty, then at some point you still need to negotiate and to earn sovereignty. Here, maybe the issue is not to earn sovereignty because the sovereignty issue within the EU is extremely complex and quite open, but to earn membership. So maybe we should also try to put into the discourse this idea of earn membership to the EU. And in the code of conduct, that would set these conditions that uh, allow a legitimate people or nation without a state to claim for full participation that it will earn its membership by respecting those conditions. So that would be my first comment. Thank you. Okay, Professor Waters, what do you think about? ¿Qué, qué piensa Professor Waters sobre, sobre ello? Yes, thanks very much. So, I mean, just on this, this very much this last point, I was just thinking uh, uh, about that, what, what Nicholas just said. I mean, it seems to me earned membership, if we're focusing on that on, uh, and this was a theme that I raised, obviously, uh, indirectly, if we're focusing that on uh, a continuing claim of membership, I, I think in theory, that's an extremely attractive claim. Um, I, I suspect in terms of our project of developing standards, that's a, 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 an even more difficult path. I, I would take the same thought that he just raised and say, let's reorient that towards the claimants themselves. That sounds like making it harder, but this is one of my themes is we, we have to make that the proof of, uh, of, you know, of quality in a sense or, or of, of deservingness. This is what Will Williams was talking about in a sense. And I think that actually strengthens the hands of the claimants, just as a pragmatic matter, the idea, and we can see this from the behavior within the EU regarding Poland and Hungary, the idea that we're going to develop some standard um, that's going to review continuing membership on these grounds, um, fr frankly strikes me as even less likely than the uh, somewhat quixotic project that we're all embarked upon. Um, so I think this one's tough enough, um, but I think the idea is absolutely right, that that's the way to go to develop a claim you know, not not to automatic membership as of right, but to a claim to negotiate and prove it, that that door alone would be a tremendous advance for claimant groups to say, we have a right to show you that we can do all the things that would be necessary to, to earn membership. This would already be so much more than is available in the current um, sort of doctrinal and conceptual framework where, where that just that door doesn't have to ever even be open. So I think I'm agreeing with what Nicholas says. I just am perhaps targeting the, the addressee slightly differently, but that's, I, I think, exactly right. It's a pragmatic goal. ¿Qué te, ¿Algún comentario más eh, sobre, sobre este primer punto? Eh, Profesora McEwen. Perhaps just to respond to Nicholas' uh, comment about what I was saying. I mean, I, I'm not sure that there is sufficient clarity within the treaties to be able to say that an interpretation of secession um, as running counter to an ethos of integration is right or wrong. My point was simply to say that that is a view that is quite strongly held. And I think it betrays a misunderstanding of the, the ambitions of many of the, the the, the movements that we've been discussing here. So I, I think it's incumbent on those that are intending to intervene if they, um, or that we are encouraging to intervene, um, that there is some understanding, some learning process, because otherwise the intervention is, is as likely to be um, unhelpful as, as helpful. Um, and just on the, on the um, I can't remember who it was that suggested um, a reform to Article 50. Um, and I think, and Nicholas, I think again, was talking about an Article 49 shift to enable a kind of internal enlargement type of process. But there would presumably have to also be a shift there because that is predicated uh, in the Copenhagen criteria, predicated on statehood. So, until such time as statehood is achieved, then there needs to be some additional process uh, that would enable some sort of middle ground or middle way or, or, or reformed uh, status and relationship. Um, and that's why I think I am um, really attracted to the idea that Timothy introduced around 
um, reframing secession as subsidiarity. And I think that would be worthy of, of and I, I noticed somebody else in the, in the chat mentioned that too. So I think it would be worthy of discussing that and thinking about how we might bring that into, into a framework and into a code. Professor Quartrop, uh, ¿quiere añadir alguna cosa? Tiene que... Eh... Okay, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I didn't have the uh, benefit of listening to the earlier intervention, so I'm slightly in the dark. So, uh, so I'm not quite sure what I'm responding to. If you could just uh, enlighten me. Bueno, estábamos, la verdad es que el, tengo que decir que el, el panel que, que estamos ahora digamos protagonizando tenía que ver más y tiene y intentaré que tenga que ver con el código de buenas prácticas y digamos a veces pasa no y hemos empezado hablando de Europa aunque el panel primero era el que estaba uh, dirigido a hablar estrictamente sobre Europa entonces más que recuperar eh, lo que estábamos diciendo hasta ahora yo le plantearía una nueva pregunta profesor Quartrup que creo que que tiene que ver con con el uso de referéndums eh, en su especialidad y eh, tiene que ver con la idea que antes nos en, también introducía el profesor Lebra en el, la discusión anterior, en una de sus intervenciones, hasta qué punto el, el situar unos límites, unos, eh, eh, unos límites de supermayorías eh, está, a, digamos, eh, rompiendo ¿no? con esa idea de que todos los votos cuentan igual. ¿Y cómo podría eso ser sustituido? Recupero, no sé si lo hago correctamente, eh, el, la idea del profesor Lebra, si eso podría ser eh, sustituido por una cascada, digamos, de referéndums en los que si no se consiguiera por parte de alguna de las dos posiciones una supermayoría, eso podría implicar eh, en la repetición de un nuevo referéndum. Me gustaría saber su opinión, puesto que usted es experto en referéndums, y después volveremos a algunas de las, de las ideas de los vídeos de este debate en concreto. ¿Quieres que me responda? Porque estoy afraid que mi español no es suficiente para entender nada de eso, francamente. Ah, ok. Entonces, so, no, um, déjame... Me... Ah, ok. Sí, puedo escucharme ahora. Puedo escucharme, sí, en inglés. Estoy muy afraid. Maybe... No okay. leo en español. Okay, so or maybe Professor Lebra, if you want to, I think that you wanted to to talk, if you want to um, compliment my comment because I was paraphrasing you, you want Professor Lebra to to. I, I would just like to have the question in English because I don't understand Spanish to that level. Oh, oh yeah, but you 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 are not using the translation. Okay, I, I can go on by talking. Uh, 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 interpretation. Okay. Uh... I will try to see if I can, yes, but it's... Uh... Okay, no problem. I, I'm going... Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. You, you have the interpretation now? Uh, I think I do. Yes, yes, I do. Yes. I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't told there was an interpretation that way. Okay, I, I appreciate it. So the question was about super majorities and referendums, whether that's part of the norms, if I understand correctly. Is that right? Efectivamente. Lo que estaba comentando era... Eh introducir un comentario del, del panel anterior, del debate anterior, que había lanzado el profesor Lebra yes. sobre la posibilidad de que eh, para no uh, supervalorar, para no uh, digamos, primar a una de las dos posiciones, el profesor Lebra eh, proponía el uso de referéndums en cascadas de tal manera que hasta que una de las dos posiciones, en el caso de que sea una pregunta sí. binaria, no alcanzase un mínimo, eh, una mínima mayoría, ese referéndum pudiera irse repitiendo sin, en este caso, privilegiar a ninguna de las dos partes, puesto que eh, hasta no alcanzar ese mínimo, el referéndum sería repitiendo. Es decir, que no estás dando... Eh, una, una supermayoría en la necesidad de alcanzar una supermayoría a ninguna de las dos posiciones es una pregunta que tiene que ver muy, con, muy claramente con referéndums y por eso quería empezar conociendo su, su opinión al respecto Uh, well, thank you very much. That uh, I actually I understood some of that. I'm actually quite pleased about that. I think when it comes to uh, to referendums uh, and supermajorities, 
uh, and also referendums and a recognition in the European Union and elsewhere, uh, it, it's very easy to, uh, to sort of get carried away with the legal norms and so on. And the fact of the matter is that the legal norms, and I'll come back to the supermajorities in a second, but the fact of the matter is that the, the norms for recognition of these referendums seem to be rather opportunistic. You know, when, um, when the, 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 the former states in the Soviet Union, the, the Latvians and the, the, the Estonians and so on, wanted to secede and the countries in, uh, in, in former Yugoslavia wanted to secede, the Badinter co uh, Commission, headed by a former French uh, Minister of Justice, Badinter, uh, said that a referendum would be pretty much sufficient. I'm, I'm slightly paraphrasing there. Then when we came round to to the uh, the Macedonian referendum, there had to be a supermajority, uh, which I think Solana actually negotiated, uh, a local boy, uh, and that was 55%. And when it came around to, to the Catalan one, uh, it was suddenly completely illegal. Uh, uh, now, I think it might well be that the Catalan one was illegal, but it's but if it could have been a, an advisory referendum, that might have been okay. So I think when we're talking about either supermajority requirements, they always tend to have a political motive. I've never seen a single case where a supermajority requirement has been proposed by the party that wants to have independence. It's inconceivable that the SNP in Scotland would want to have uh, Nicola can, can can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm not. Uh, would I want a supermajority requirement of 55%? Uh, I don't think the uh, Le Boc Québécois or Critique Québécois in, in Quebec would ever want to have a supermajority requirement. So it seems to be a way of moving the goalposts. Now, I think if you want to have supermajority or qualified majority requirements, then you could have one that ensures that the participation rate is over 50%. But I think when you have these supermajority requirements, they have only ever, uh, in, in my opinion, and in my, I mean, of the of the 62 referendums on independence that have always been uh, uh, successful or non-successful, none of them have, um, uh, in none of the cases have there been uh, supermajority requirements uh, proposed by any other countries. Uh, that eventually became independent. Uh, there also, we have a number of credible cases where there was no supermajority requirement, Norway, Iceland, uh, Malta. And in the case of Malta, for example, it was a relatively narrow majority. So I think, uh, I think the supermajority requirement is a, uh, a way of moving the goalpost. It's a way of, of preventing the inevitable. Uh, and whenever you have a, uh, a, a solid majority of, of, for something, then, uh, or a majority of something that suffices. Uh, we had the Brexit referendum here in the United Kingdom, which is a kind of independence referendum, which was won by by fifty uh, one point nine percent on a on a in a turnout in the low seventies, uh, and that was considered to be enough. So, so supermajority requirements are uh, are relatively rare and tend to be politically motivated. Uh, as for the idea of the cascading referendum, or you could like have a sort of like a uh, I remember I, I uh, once had a little bit of a spat with the then uh, First Minister of Scotland, uh, Alex Salmon, who proposed to have a, a, a sort of multi-option referendum because he thought he could get that through. And, uh, and after a bit of chewing and throwing, he gave up on that idea and we had some uh, an interesting debate about it. Uh, but uh, one of the things that were considered there was to have a runoff of options where you start off with, say, five different uh, proposals, and then two of them will then go off to a runoff, which is what they had in in Newfoundland in uh, in Canada in the late 1940s. Uh, so I think that would be a possibility to have that. But Newfoundland is frankly the only example of uh, one of these runoffs in independence uh, referendums. Uh, so I, I think it. It does make sense. You can also have a multi-option referendum. Uh, they had that in uh, in Puerto Rico at some stage. Uh, in that particular referendum, people voted for none of the above. Uh, but I think the idea of a of a cascade cascade of referendum also has sort of an undertone of we don't really want this to happen, and we're you know trying to sort of push off the inevitable. 
uh, in a way, you could argue that in France, in the case of Algeria, they had a couple of referendums before that, uh, but that was only to get legitimacy for a policy that was deeply unpopular to uh, Charles de Gaulle's base. Charles de Gaulle, we should remember, was a politician with a populist bent who was willing to stand up to, to his base, but that's a different story, I guess. Any any reaction? I, I don't know if Professor Lebra wants to, or maybe Professor Waters, please. If I might, I, I just wanted to follow up with, with Matt's excellent comments um, uh, on one particular point, and, and I, I I agree. I, I sort of myself have inclined towards supermajority, but but with the qualification that it's it's a it's a it's a trade off. It's a question of purchasing more political legitimacy by by raising that goalpost. And I take your point that. Um, it depends on who's raising the goalpost. I, I didn't want to ask about one particular set of cases, and these are the ones that interest me most, um, and, and perhaps is why I've leaned more in that direction in thinking about it, is what about the groups that don't have an existing unit in which they're operating? Because as I, as I mentioned in, in my intervention, I could imagine the, the sort of a bare majority model where there's a unit, it still really, really raises serious legitimacy problems. I think we, Brexit's a good example of that in terms of the challenges that arise when you don't have a very strong majority. But what about groups that don't have that defined unit? For, for me, that, that might be one place where it would make sense to say, we need a much higher signal because the unit is itself being somehow defined by this process. Um, and, and you're gonna be dragging a lot of people out um, uh, if you use a bare majority. Is that a place where it makes sense? And then maybe that's the second part of my question um, relates to the other point about the multi-option. Um, how, how are we going to develop that as a process? Because it seems to me, the reason I've inclined towards a binary is because if we're thinking about standards, once we have multiple options, we're back in that very zone you described where this is about a, a kind of political gamesmanship uh, of crafting a set of complex options that once we start to dissolve into complexity, our standards are going to be um, sort of you know, unusable is my, is my fear. So mm. what, what do you think about that point? Is there a space for supermajority where we're talking about undefined units as the, as the first question? Thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, Timothy, that's for me. Uh, uh, good to see you, by the way, Timothy. Uh, I've read your book and even quoted it, so uh, it's nice to meet you in the in, in, in cyberspace. Uh, I think there is a place for a multi-option referendum where we're trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, at the moment, there is a big debate uh, in India where people, uh, the Sikhs from Punjab, want to have a referendum on their status, and Modi is, you know, cracking down on that. It's it's. Uh, it's seditious, and I don't know what, uh, to even contemplate that particular possibility that Punjab could be an independent state. Uh, and I think in that particular case, it, it could be uh, a, a good way to, um, to ascertain what people actually want as a kind of, and that's where, I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic in, in, in that regard to a, uh, a, uh, a multi-option referendum and even a cascading number of referendums because it's in the early phases of finding out what kind of, uh, of system do you want. And I think in, in that way you could, I mean, the, again, the, the case of Newfoundland uh, is an interesting one. Uh, there were people in Newfoundland who, who said, well, we would like to be uh, part of the United States, we would like to be a Canadian province, we would like to be independent, or we would like to remain a colony uh, as, a, as a part of the United Kingdom. Uh, and all of those options were, were as it were, up for grabs. Uh, and, um, and then they, they sort of, you know, were able to weed them out, as it were, uh, and then finally have a runoff after that. So I, I think that there can, there can be a, a place for that. I think in when we're dealing with political uh, processes, I think we have to have a, a fairly open mind. And I think we have to, to go for a little bit of a bespoke approach. Uh, and before you get to the, sort of the big question, should we split up or not? Uh, then I need. I think you need to 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 figure out the the various options. So so in case of divorce law, as well as in the cases of uh, of the divorce of nations, I think you have to to figure out the the various options first. Are you going to be cohabiting uh, under the same roof, but uh, but in, in different parts of the building, or or are you just going to you know make up, or are you going to break up? All of those things, I think, will be open to a an advisory. 
uh, multi-option referendum. So I, I, I could live with that. I think there's a, a space for that. Uh, and I think it's important that we have an open mind. And I think every time we don't have an open mind, the reason why we don't have an open mind is because these referendums are much more about law and high politics than they're about, uh, or not about, they're more about politics, high politics than they're about constitutional law and principles. Professor Lebra había pedido la palabra. Yeah, bring some precision uh, on these different issues. Uh, the issue of supermajority. My point was that supermajority should be for both sides. So mm. if you have 55, if those against do not reach 55, then it's non-decided. Because basically you could have a minority who is against, but the supermajority is not reached, so it's the minority who decide. That's not democracy. So basically if you have a supermajority, it's for both sides. So against independence, more than 55%. If it's 52, 48, then it's non-decided. This is why usually it's 50 plus one, because at mm -hmm. least you have a decision. So if you have a supermajority, it's for both sides. And then if it's within the margin, then it would make sense to have another referendum. A referendum. That was my proposal. Second, about your question, Timothy, where you don't have a territory. Once again, we had this example in the Jura question in Switzerland. And the vote was organized local government by local government, commune by, by commune. And then those who voted in favor at the local level, they gathered together and they create this new unit. And those local level who voted against remain in the former state of Canton de Berne. So that, that could be done uh, without having a predefined territory. Third precision, and then I'll stop. Uh, about the Copenhagen process. My idea was not to reproduce the content at all. It's just a process. Again, in 1993, for those who were already into European affairs, it was absolutely not clear whether the EU wanted to enlarge or not. It was not clear. France was totally against. It was deepening, not enlarging, and so on. So basically, there was this trade-off. Okay, we set the principle that new member states can come in, but we set condition for them. So my idea was only about the process, not about the content. This idea that, okay, we recognize their claims for sovereignty and we don't deny them, but then we set rules of the game, which can be quite restrictive, but at least there is recognition that the claim is legitimate. That, that was the only reference to Copenhagen, not to the content. Thank you. No sé si profesora McEwen quiere añadir algo o lanzo una nueva pregunta, como, como usted prefiera. Um, well, perhaps just briefly, um, I mean, I, I agree with Nicola that if you do have any sort of supermajority threshold, then it has to be applied to both sides. But I think it also has to be with an obligation to revisit. Otherwise, you just have stalemate and prolonged dispute. That doesn't, it's not a resolution to say that nobody wins. Um, so th there has to be some sort of process built in there. And I think, you know, the, the panel this morning, we're talking about something, something similar. Um, I suppose the other thing to think about is whether um, a, a narrow majority, particularly where you have um, a country where the population is not evenly dispersed, if you have, a, if you're creating t new territorial grievances within a territory um, that does not, um, does not support the, 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 the constitutional change. And again, that's difficult, it's, it's difficult in both ways, um, but I think these are all the things that we should be considering. And on the, on the, um, the multi-option referendum, there's, I think there is always a risk that the more you reflect the complexity of opinion, the more uh, difficult and complex is the process. And I think we need to try to make the process as clear and as simple as, an access, as accessible as possible while balancing that with reflecting views. And I think if, if there was to be a, a multi-option referendum, my preference has always been to have two questions with two options rather than a plethora of options in a single question. So in that case, the first option would be, do you want change? Um, and if you want the change, or, or, and, and the second question was, well, which change do you want? Mm. But at that point, you have to have a, a, a detailed set of proposals for each thing. That, that was the difference between, say, the Brexit referendum and 
some of the other referendums that we've seen in that the Brexit referendum was nothing at all. It was, it was leave. It was an idea. It was whatever you wanted it to be. There's nothing mm. substantial underpinning that. So if you're going to have, say, a referendum that is for independence or for enhanced autonomy, then both of those things have to be accompanied by practical um, um, practical prospectus of what that would look like. And of course, all of that would be subject to negotiation, but it's it, it's, um, it doesn't help the process. It doesn't clarify the process or the outcome if it's, if it's simply a label or an idea that is open to interpretation to be anything that you want it to be. Professor Quattro, before. Uh, yes, I, know, uh, I think that's, that's, um, that's certainly the case, and I tr uh, really agree with you there, Nicola. I think one of the things we haven't talked about here, uh, also pertaining to referendum, is to look at the Irish process. So Ireland had a very divisive issue, which was, uh, which was abortion, uh, and instead of having a multi-option referendum, which they could have had, they could have had the number of weeks you can have or no abortion whatsoever and so on, they had a citizen's jury, uh, and then a... Uh, a I think about 250 people were gathered together in a number of weekends where they've given a number of options and they've given all the evidence, they had expert testimony uh, and so on. And then they uh, all de debated, uh, and these people, of course, being uh, chosen in a representative way, uh, they then chose an ex a, a, a proposal that could be put to the voters. They then, in the case of the abortion referendum, voted on that in the citizens' uh, assembly, and 64% uh, of the people at the assembly voted for uh, the proposal, and then when it was put to the people of, uh, of Ireland, 62% uh, uh, voted for that. And I think the the citizens jury, I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit of a cottage industry in Ireland where they've said to uh, to all the British, look, this is how you run a referendum and we're a civilised place. And if only you'd done it the same way, it would have been much better. And I, I can sort of see the bit of schadenfreude in, in that particular argument. However, I think the, the idea of a citizens jury would be imminently uh, sensible and also would provide for... Uh, a way in which we could get a proper debate, which is actually defined by what it is it that we want. Um, uh, and there wouldn't be this sort of like free for all, uh, all things to all women kind of thing that we had in Brexit, or indeed that we've had even in other referendums where it wasn't quite clear. I, mean, I think even the Scottish referendum, uh, there was a, a, an element of that. It wasn't quite as bad. And I think it was much more mature, the debate there. But there was also those people who favoured independence had had an idea and a vision that was very different from, from, from those who didn't. So even, even in that referendum, it was there. But I think if you, you have to have uh, and the, the government of, of Scotland, uh, Salmon's administration at the time, were admirably clear. I mean, they had the whole uh, white paper, which was in you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages, where they said, this is what you're voting on. Uh, but, but I think it would have been much better had there been a citizen's jury before, which could have come up with a... Uh, a, a, a proposal that would then reflect uh, the state of play as it was at the time. Um, but I think that's, 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 that's a possibility that, he, that ought to be looked into. Pues, eh, tomaría este punto del, del jurado ciudadano para preguntaros hasta qué nivel pensáis que un código de buenas prácticas tendría que entrar al detalle. ¿Al detalle o tendría que ser más bien unos principios generales. A veces eh, se ha hecho, o nos preguntan ¿no? también a los periodistas, oye, ¿esto es como una ley de claridad? ¿Lo que estáis intentando promover es como una ley de claridad? Y mm, de momento, ¿no? la, la respuesta que acostumbramos a, a dar, y, y nos gustaría, me gustaría eh, compartirla con vosotros, es que más bien tiene, tendría una, una equivalencia, si, si es posible, bueno, precisamente la opinión, el, el dictamen, el Tribunal Supremo del Canadá y esa ponderación de principios, que son principios y valores. Entonces, la, la, la idea que os planteo es, eh, ¿qué nivel de detalle creéis que debería eh, contener un, unas bases de un código de buenas prácticas? ¿O si identificáis cómo hacemos nosotros de momento ese código como un documento con una filosofía parecida a la que puede expresarse en el dictamen del Tribunal Supremo del Canadá, que lógicamente tiene que ver con el Cana tiene está circunscrito 
a Canadá y no al ámbito europeo. ¿Cómo, cómo situaríais el, el rol, el papel de este código de, de buenas prácticas? Anyone? Yes, I mean, if I may ask that, answer that question, I think that it's, it's, it's a very clear answer to that. Yes, there has to be a lot of regulation. Uh, I think a Clarity Act would be brilliant. It's just a problem in Canada is that the Clarity Act was pretty unclear. Uh, if we had taken the re Quebec case, which prompted the Clarity Act, uh, or the Unclarity Act, as I like to call it, then that would have been fine. The, the, the re Quebec case actually outlines in, in, in considerable detail uh, what the process ought to be. Say, so, well, if, if there is a clear majority, uh, then they, they have a, a right to negotiation. Uh, I'm, uh, I've just finished a book that's called Democracy on Demand, uh, where I, uh, which is based on, on interviews with, uh, with, with scholars and, and experts uh, and analysis of, of the re legal framework of referendums uh, around the world. And one of the things that is interesting is that very few places have these, uh, um, uh, these, uh, the, these regulations. Uh, only three countries in the world regulate how online campaigning works. Uh, Estonia is, is one of them. Uh, very few places have, have rules on campaign spending. Own, uh, 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 only about 27% have rules on that government spending. So all those issues are, are enormously important uh, in, uh, in referendum cases. And I think what is needed is an international practice. I mean, there is the Venice Commission and, and, and things like that, but there needs to be a, a proper international practice for how referendums are conducted uh, on campaign spending, government spending, the use of, of social media in particular, uh, and, um, and and also uh, you know code of practice for. Uh, uh, for, 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 for other media. And I think what is interesting in Britain is that we have the Political Parties Elections and Referendum Act from, from, uh, from the beginning of this uh, century, which was in, in many ways is, is, is second to none and really outlines how you ought to, to regulate a referendum. The only problem with that one is that it didn't regulate online campaigning. And then uh, it was, it was, that was also open to abuse. So we need to have proper regulation of the process and in many cases there is no proper regulation like in Greece for example when they decided to have the referendum on the European bailout uh, they it took them a I think 10 days from when they made the decision to have a referendum to the day that they were voting and it was a free-for-all there was no I, I, the question ran into 500 words uh, and and it was uh, you know it, it, it wasn't it, if you like, conducive to a, a proper debate. So I think the, uh, the Scottish referendum, which was run under the PAPARA rules of political party elections and referendum uh, act rules, was in, in some ways a, a model of, a, uh, of an independence referendum. But I think there ought to be international norms that we all agree on as to when referendums are, are proper and legitimate. Uh, and, uh, and I think if we can have that, then we would have also have more faith in the process. Uh, having said that, by the way, in, in our referendum here, the leave side spent less money than the, uh, than the remain side. So uh, maybe it was the will of the people. It just happens not to be the will of, of this particular voter. Professor Lebra, por favor. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are two different strategies and objects. Uh, one could be, as you proposed, uh, Professor Crotrop, to produce code of good conduct on sovereignty referenda. Uh, I have a colleague who wrote his PhD on that some years ago and so on. So there, there are practice, but that's not really the issue we're gathering for. I mean, referenda is one way to initiate or to terminate or to put the process forward. But basically, there's also a part of negotiation, whichever way you look at it. And clearly, the Supreme Court judgment of 98 in Canada was sending people back to negotiation. So one strategy could say, OK, we, we will define this code of good conduct for referenda. And within that, we hide a few things about sovereignty referenda, and maybe it goes through. But in my view, it's it's a difficult strategy. The other one, uh, and I think it was uh, Timothy's argument, saying the essential part is that it is recognized as a legitimate process. Mm -hmm. And that's the major aim 
then okay, there could be some rules of the game and so on. But basically, through setting up a few rules, and then that would lead for rather few general principles. The important thing that the trade-off for those uh, governments, member state of the EU or member state of Council of Europe, whatever, would be that they recognize that it is a legitimate debate to have. It's a legitimate issue. And then I think if we go into too many details, there are so many specificities in different cases and so on that we have no chance to reach anything. So it's, for me, two very different strategies. And personally, I think we embarked with the theme of this uh, meeting rather on the second strategy, even though referenda are important, I'm not sure it's the aim of, of the whole exercise. Thank you. Yeah, Nicola, please. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. Um, and I, I think to have a, a code of conduct that is um, applicable to the whole variety of, of cases uh, that we are concerned with, I think it really has to be at the, the high level of principles and, and values, um, but with a steer to their interpretation. Otherwise, you know, you run the risk of having a set of principles that are so open to such a wide variety of interpretations that it doesn't really take us take us very far. But I think um, recognition of the legitimacy of the issues, um, I think, is fundamental um, to to what I think we hope to hope to achieve with this. And and just moving beyond um, the the assumption of, of these as internal matters to individual nation states. I think that in itself, recognition of that would be an achievement. Timothy, please. Yeah, so I, I think I, I largely agree with, with all these comments and I was thinking, connecting your question back to what Matt said about the citizen's jury. I think that's a great example or a great model although I'm not sure how well it would work in my own country. I'm not going to give anyone electoral advice <laughs> uh, these days where I'm sitting. Um, but but it's, a, it's an example of a model that works if the underlying principle's already been accepted, right? It's not something that's going to work well. Uh, it's not a good strategy, I think, uh, in a place where that's deeply contested. Whereas, you know, you can try informal referenda. There are other models, civil disobedience. There are ways to strategize in the face of opposition. Citizens' jury is, is a model once something else has been accepted. So for me, the whole project, and I agree, I think Matt's point earlier was quite right. Uh, there's a risk of sort of making this too lawyerly. Um, uh, and yet now we have to think about what's the right level of regu regulation. For, for me, it's, it's, it's a strategic purpose. And much as Nicola, and I think Nicholas both just said, um, we're not intending to design like an ideal theory regulatory project, you know, as if we were sort of philosopher kings and if we got to make the rules ourselves. I understand the purpose of each detail as being uh, to vindicate the principle, that we include those models and details and levels of specificity that help to entrench the strategic claim that this is legitimate, right? And I think Nicholas is right. There's a risk of focusing too much on referenda, but I suppose the reason we're doing that is because the bet's gotta be on some general claim of democratic legitimacy. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. It's gotta be multiple models. And, and if you had that strategic concession, then there are many ways to do this. So for me, it's about picking the level of detail that vindicates that principle. And I have to say, even though I was, I was fully convinced by what Matt and Nicola said about um, uh, uh, super majorities cascading and so forth uh, uh, and multiple options, things I've been way more rigid on in my own thinking, I, I think that's the reason I stick on those is because to buy that legitimacy, we should opt for very high standards. Not that that's the end point, but to get concession. If it's too detailed, too specific, and too ambitious, it's just going to be a dead ideal project, right? It won't have any political purchase. That's why I think strategically higher standards, not because they're the best end model, but the way to get in the door, maybe. And then if you, if you gain that strategic goal of fundamental concession that this is legitimate at the European level, well, then many models are possible and they'll get articulated at the local level. And, and one of my thoughts is you have high standards, every state's free to lower them. 
right? Because I think of this like a you know minimum maxima or I don't know, maximum minima, something like that. Um, and, and states could say, you know, we're going to do better than that. So if hypothetically we had a supermajority, although I actually agree, it's you know, there's, there's a case for not doing it. But supposing that was our model, nothing prevents the state from saying, well, we're going to be like the UK and accept a bare majority model. You can come down from that. What's going to be hard is to get states above that, to accept you know, what's incredibly ambitious, low standards, that they should accept this norm, which is risky to their sovereignty. For me, that's the strategic purpose. Every bit of detail is only about getting that principle conceded by more and more states in Europe. Antes de seguir, me gustaría invitar a... Son unas horas que en, aquí en el marco, digamos, eh, hispánico, mediterráneo, es una hora un poco más complicada, pero invito a todo el mundo, a todos los participantes, a que, a que, a que puedan enviarnos eh, sus preguntas, en, ya sabéis, en, esta, en el botón preguntas y respuestas. Yo quería retomar, quería retomar esa... Esa idea, efectivamente, de que el código, esas bases, el proyecto que estamos eh, que vamos a presentar mañana eh, tiene que ver con una interpretación eh, abierta, eh, de base, eh, que no fija los detalles, sino que quiere inspirar también, desde la soft politics también, ¿no? un cambio de, de paradigma. Y aquí mi pregunta es, si, ¿cómo lo veis? Si es una cuestión estrictamente estratégica, o es que ha cambiado nuestra forma de pensar sobre esta cuestión. Y voy, voy a ser uh, muy concreto. En estos momentos, yo creo que especialmente viniendo de la mesa anterior, estamos como girando en torno al consenso de subrayar la importancia del de procedimiento, ¿no? de procedural, eh, de, 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 del proceso como eh, digamos, el elemento central, asegurar que este proceso tiene, combina ¿no? elementos democráticos, elementos de rule of law, elementos constitucionales y dejamos en un segundo plano eh, la evocación o la, la, el, 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 hagamos la llamada al derecho a la autodeterminación, a, a este tipo de, de elementos que alguien podría pensar que son estratégicos, sin más, es decir, eh, es, es, es estrategia. Pero yo quería plantearos si, con vuestra perspectiva académica también, ¿Creéis que estamos en un momento o vamos hacia una, una perspectiva en la que desde una visión plural, eh, digamos, de, de, de las distintas preferencias incluso individuales de la ciudadanía, nos parece más relevante señalar y defender que haya digamos, libertad, que haya democracia por poder cambiar las fronteras siguiendo los procedimientos democráticos, que más que no, y no tanto una reivindicación de unos principios nacionales eh, tradicionales. Y, y aquí también quería añadir si el, había una, un, una estación intermedia que supuso, en algunos casos, el derecho a decidir como una concepción no jurídica que enfatizaba la voluntad por encima de la historia o las tradiciones. Eh, en resumen... ¿Es un movimiento estratégico o pensáis que estamos cambiando el paradigma y nos estamos situando en la defensa de, 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 de esa combinación de principios, derecho a constitucionalismo, eh, rule of law, uh, para uh, enmarcar cualquier demanda y considerarla legítima? No sé quién quiere empezar. O si se ha entendido la pregunta o... ¿O ha sido más un comentario que una pregunta? Sí. Um, oh, Nicola, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Jama, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I quite followed, but um, I, mean, I, th I think, I suppose I always try to approach these things strategically. Um, so what what is the point of doing this and you know trying to to, to do it in a way that tries to um, at least reach that strategic goal um i yeah well i was convinced by the discussion this morning around the need to sort of focus on procedures um so maybe i'm just contradicting myself from a, from a few minutes ago um, but i wonder if that makes more sense when thinking about um the 
the intervention of Europe broadly defined, because that's where you, you, I mean, obviously I'm talking about European context here, but the more you get into procedures and specifics within states or within sub-state nations, then that's obviously going to be very heavily context specific um, and operating within different regulatory environments. Um, but if we are trying to um, foster a, a greater sense of um, responsibility or, or a greater sense that there is a role to play here um, beyond the member state, then that I think um, is can be both about principles, the high level principles, the interpretation of those principles and perhaps some procedural mechanisms as well. Um, so I guess a bit of both. Um, it's what I would suggest. Uh, Lebra, Professor Lebra. Yes, thank you. Uh, if I may add, yes, that's another uh, very strategic issue. And basically, that brings us back to the whole dynamic of European integration. You take highly sensitive political questions and you proceduralize them in a lot of institutions and technical debates and so on. And then it becomes manageable. That's what the whole integration process is about. It's depolitization of highly political issue. I mean, basically, it started with, you know, war between France, Germany, and other countries. And now it's just a matter of the curve of banana and so on. We may find it stu stupid, but it did work. And if I take back my example of the Copenhagen Declaration, it's only four principles. But then the European Commission starts working and you have these seven, 27 chapters that you have to negotiate and so on and so on. At, at some point, you win. It's not a political issue anymore. You've just checked the 27 chapter of negotiation and you win. Whereas it is a hugely political issue. And so, yes, the more procedure you put, the less politicized it becomes. But is it what we want or not? We, we may have to discuss it because it may also lead, this is what happened with Ukraine. Basically the accession agreement, uh, association agreement, sorry, between Ukraine and the EU, which led to a, a, a war in Ukraine was seen as a pure technical matter. And all the bugs have been checked and they say, okay, we signed the agreement. And nobody just said, oh, wait, wait, there's a political issue there. So somehow there is also a trade-off. I mean, proceduralizing is depoliticizing, and so maybe it makes it more palatable. But on the other hand, at some point, politics has to come back in. So, again, a trade-off. Uh, so I, I, it's exactly the line I was thinking while, while you were speaking, Jamé. I, I wrote down um, what could be more European than talking about procedure, um, and I think that's. That's right here. And this is why it's not my field, but this is why I was focusing uh, in, in part of my intervention on subsidiarity, um, because I think even more than referenda, even more than uh, a claim about democracy, which is sort of our core strategic purpose, um, perhaps even behind that uh, would be as a strategic purpose of everything we're doing to um, challenge and defeat the claim that sovereignty disputes uh, are, and change in sovereignty is, is somehow um, antithetical to the European project. That's the key concession, um, is, is to get European institutions to acknowledge uh, and, and polities that whatever the outcome of a dispute by whatever legitimated process, um, that that's not the same as a desire or a need to withdraw from European institutions. If you achieve that, everything else is going to start working. And, and I think that the path of procedure, uh, the sort of numbing path of, of the, the, the fiction that there's no politics in this procedure is probably the right way to go. I think that's exactly exactly it. And for me, again, though it's not my field, that was my intuition that's, that if you could convey this as subsidiarity, which I think is plausible as a logical argument, um, then, then half the work is done because it's exactly what Nicholas just said. It ceases to be on its surface politics and it's forced into this procedural mode. That's an enormous victory. No sé si Professor Quattro quiere añadir algo. Do you want to add something, or Professor Quattro? Or I just... Uh, well, Nicola, please, you have first... So, 
<clears throat> so I, just, I, had, I had a question for Timothy. Um, in, in your presentation, you said something about, um, and you made an analogy to a Mediterranean context, and I wasn't sure I followed. Could you clarify what you meant there? To Mediterranean, you know, I, I cannot vouch for my own words. <laughs> what, what Mediterranean context? And by the way, I want to say I was delighted that you said you thought that my subsidiarity argument made sense. That is not a thing I've heard very often. So it's, <laughs> it's lovely to, to know it. So um, I don't remember. Maybe, maybe I just have to watch the video again, context. but maybe I just um, picked it up wrong. I have to think about that. Sorry. OK, no problem. Okay. Yeah, what room? Yes, you asked me if I have. You asked me if I have anything to add uh, to all of this, and I think just. Uh, I mean, I, I, I suppose I echo most of what's been said before, but I think it's important that. Um, I mean, what Nicholas was saying uh, about only four principles, and then they sort of uh, they they pr proliferate, and and suddenly we have because bureaucrats have to 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 earn a living, and they have to to, to and then it becomes sort of complicated, and I think that is. Uh, uh, always the case with uh, with with European things. You men mentioned the Bendy Bananas, that of course we know is the story that was made up by the current Prime Minister of Britain. Uh, so it's also sometimes it's it's uh, exaggerated, but I think uh, it, it is important that we regulate the process. I think it's also important that we regulate the process because it then narrows down the uh, the, the politicisation of what should be a practical thing, um, namely that certain people want to live together and, and other ones want to live apart. And I think it's important that we, that we, in some ways, we it is a political argument, but sometimes it's also a political argument that is being made more political because people have an interest in that. And then we, we see the sort of the populist arguments and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think while it is not, particularly sexy to say that we want uh, regulation, I think it is imminently practical uh, and we have to live in the real world and the real world is extremely regulated in every way. Uh, and, um, and while that will lead to what Max Weber called the disenchantment of the world and occasionally we have to find ways in which we can combat that and people may find that illegitimate, at the end of the day, uh, things are very practical and are very technical and regulated. Uh, and it's just most of us don't don't see that every day, but I'm living through the process of my country leaving and, and Nicola uh, is too, uh, the country you're currently in. Uh, that, that may change, uh, our, uh, one may hope, or as it were. Uh, but the, the, the place of the part of the United Kingdom I'm, I'm living in now, uh, it's um, it's dealing with a number of things that are that they didn't realise were regulated, like you know double taxation principles and things like that. Uh, and and those rules may be annoying, but they also make things work. So I think we 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 have to recognise that regulation in this field uh, is important. And regulation does not mean that we won't have uh, the high philosophical principles. I think we can we should have both. We need the high philosophical principles. We need to have ways in which we can have the dreams and the aspirations and, and all of that, and the poetry of, uh, of, of the political. But we also need the practice of, of regulations to make things work. Um, pues estamos en los últimos minutos de, de, del debate y a mí me gustaría también compartir ¿no? la idea que, eh, como, como vosotros decíais, eh, un documento de este tipo implica también un cambio de paradigma, es decir, eh, no solo es ¿no? un documento con el que llamar a las instituciones europeas, con las que, sino contribuir a un cambio de opinión al respecto, ¿no? sobre que este tipo de demandas, de conflictos, de disputas, no van en contra del proyecto europeo, si están bien, uh, digamos, bien encardinadas, están bien conducidas, que no son son un problema interno de un Estado. Digamos, ese cambio de opinión, esa soft politics, esa o soft power, digamos, ¿cómo pensáis idealmente que se podría ir, uh, digamos, expandiendo? Es decir, el cambio de opinión, además de la opinión pública, eh, ¿puede favorecerse si eh, algunas instituciones europeas, particularmente el Consejo de Europa, empiezan a, como mínimo, a recibir 
este tipo de documentos o demandas o hacer las suyas? Es decir, permitidme la broma, ¿qué cascada de eh, instituciones podría acabar haciendo que a, alguna de ellas asumiese un documento? ¿Cuál sería el, estratégicamente el orden para conseguir ese cambio de paradigma entendiendo instituciones europeas en un sentido amplio, no, no solo la, la Comisión o el Parlamento, sino OSCE, eh, eh, Comisión, eh, perdón, eh, Consejo de Europa, etcétera. ¿Cuál sería el camino? Opinión pública, o, o, ONGs, organizaciones internacionales, es decir, eh, ¿No? En este sentido amplio, tenemos un documento, ese documento tiene una, un consenso amplio de académicos, un cambio de paradigma a nivel técnico, a nivel, digamos, científico, pero eso tiene que transformarse ¿no? en un cambio de perspectiva a nivel de opinión pública y de, y de política. Y aquí, pues, ¿cómo, cómo pensáis que, que si, si, si es que la hay, a lo mejor solo hay que ir a todas las instituciones, pero si pensáis que esa soft uh, power puede ejercerse de alguna manera para conseguir el, 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 el cambio de visión, ¿no? Sobre todo en estos dos puntos, en el punto de, o los tres puntos, ¿no? De, de es, este tipo de disputas bien canalizadas no van en contra del proyecto europeo, tienen que ver con los derechos humanos y al revés pueden fortalecer, eh, diríamos, una, una gobernanza o, o, o una estabilidad de la región del espacio europeo. ¿Cómo lo haríamos? <ríe> Será muy útil saberlo. Ok, si no one else is offering. Um, I, I don't have a clear answer but I think it is a really important question because if you think of the document as also a communication tool you need to know who you're communicating it to right so who is the audience to be targeted uh, with this and I, I my hunch is that it's the European institutions broadly defined and obviously there are maybe different levels of realism about what is possible and you know maybe think about the the way the document is framed in that way and who specifically uh, you are targeting particularly if um we are talking about interpreting the treaties as they currently are um and and suggesting that it can be the the sort of prevalent attitude that we've seen from the eu in terms of Um, sovereignty disputes as internal and not matters for them primarily, then if that's what we're trying to change, then uh, within from while using the existing treaties in order to justify that change of perception, then, you know, I, th I think targeting the Commission and others and the Council of Europe and so on is important. Um, I think it's probably a bit ambitious to suggest that we need treaty change um, and to to make the proposals in that way, um, but obviously then you would be targeting also um, member states. But I, um, I don't know, I don't have a clear answer to you, but I think it's a really important, a really important question. I don't think it's primarily um, a public opinion focus though, um, in polarizing issues like this. I don't think a document by a bunch of academics, however well respected they may be in their field, is going to do very much to Um, depoliticize the issue in that sense, but I think if you're trying to offer something practical and procedural um, and principle based, then that that should guide uh, who we target. I guess. Professor Waters, última ronda que ya estamos saliendo de, de horario. Professor Waters, please go ahead. Oh well, all right. So I, yeah, I have mine will be relatively quick because I don't have anything to say either. Um, Uh, I'm a strategist, but um, uh, I, I think uh, it, it if the, sort of on the same lines as, as, as Nicola, um, I think uh, that the very fact that we're thinking about this as sort of a regulatory and having a procedural focus and indeed seeing the proceduralism as a strategy suggests 
that, well, frankly, we ought to um, uh, uh, instrumentalize uh, Europe's famous uh, uh, democratic deficit uh, to the advantage of the project. This is an institutional argument, not a popular one. Th there's a separate track for that, it's true, um, but, but this is a decision to be made in institutions, um, not in, in streets and popular uh, movements, I think. That may be regrettable, but that's the politics of the European space. Uh, and that's where it should be focused. My intuition, therefore, is, and, and the, the main target is the European Union institutions, but they're also probably the least amenable, so that um, this, a space like Council of Europe, which is uh, sort of more marginal to the debate, is therefore more likely to be willing to, to, to take it up sort of rhetorically as a starting point, is my guess. Um, and that maybe one could think about targeting individual states as advocates inside this uh, inside the process in the European Union. Um, uh, a small list, obviously, but one could imagine it. And, and depending upon events, you might imagine a, a new member uh, that would say, you know, our experience was coming into the union through such a process, we're then gonna be an advocate. Um, that's the only, but that's as far as my strategic vision can go. As I, I, I'm an academic for a reason, so. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lebra, por favor. Yes, thank you. Um, again, I, I will stick to my idea. I think the best place to go is really at the top, the European Council. They are the only one who can take such political decisions just for the first step. Then it will uh, trickle down and Commission will start working and so on. But Commission cannot take such an initiative. Uh, I think the European Council, and as you say, Timothy, all these states that were not states 20 years ago, became state through such a process and then became member, they are quite sympathetic to the idea. We know it, at least most of them. So there are some potential support for the idea among some leaders in the European Council. Right now, the president of the European Council is not so successful. He has been somehow in, lost in the different issues that are going on. Uh, and he's from Belgium. Okay, French speaking Belgian, but still he knows this type of thing and so on. Um, so I, I see a potential opening there. I would uh, have doubts about Council of Europe uh, for one reason. I mean, I've been a civil servant in Council of Europe uh, in the early 90s, so I, I know it has changed, but I still know the house. But my, my main reason to have doubt about the Council of Europe past is that within the Council of Europe, we have Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, where these issues are also important for them, but they have a totally different perspective. And if we want to go the Council of Europe path, we will have to have Russia on board. And I'm, I mean, it can help strategically use, but it, it is another type of issue. So this is why I, I'm, I have my doubts about the uh, relevance of Council of Europe in the current political circumstances. In general, no problem, but in the current political circumstances, except maybe if you try through specialized organ like the Venice Commission or whatsoever, where you may have a more independent uh, people, um, maybe this committee for the uh, implementation of the Framework Convention on Minority Rights or things like that. But basically, we have to realize minority rights are almost the exact conceptual opposite from sovereignty claim. Basically, it's how to accommodate different groups within a defined sovereign state and not trying to have sovereignty conflict. So again, for, for this conceptual reason, I would have doubt that this is a proper framework. So I stick to my idea. I think we have to find a way to go to the top. It's mm -hmm. easier. <laughs> the last words, uh, Professor Quartro. Uh, well, I can only... Uh... Uh, concur with that idea. I think politics only gets going really if you go to the top. Uh, you know, not going to the top is uh, is, is is always a, a second choice. I think it is important that you. But politics is about those people who set the agenda, and I think you need to go to the agenda setters to uh, to make this happen. And of course, for this to happen, you also need to establish ways in which you'll be in their interest to. Uh, um, you know, to, to change the rules. Uh, it is one thing to, uh, 
to, 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 to approach them, but you have to have a reason for approaching them. You need to find an opportune moment. Uh, and, and for that reason, uh, uh, political strategy as well as legal uh, theory comes into it. Okay. So thank you very much to you all. Gracias a, a todas y a todos. Es que ricasco. Creo que ha sido una segunda mesa de debate muy interesante y muy en línea también con la primera, que se, se engarza perfectamente con el conjunto de, de, del proyecto. Y ahora, en esta jornada maratoniana que tenemos entre manos, le paso la palabra a la coordinadora del proyecto, a Beatriz, eh, para que un poco explique cuáles van a ser los siguientes pasos de la jornada. Muchas gracias.